Welcome to A Canadian Investing in the U.S., a podcast and YouTube channel focused on Canadians buying real estate with host Glenn Sutherland. Welcome to another episode of A Canadian Investing in the U.S. Our guest again, this is I think the first person that I've done twice, like legitimately twice. <laughs> Some of them were continuations of the same podcast. I have uh, Elliot Mellick with us again, who uh, is an accountant in Ottawa. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. Uh, yeah, so like, like you mentioned, I'm a U.S. and Canadian tax accountant here in Ottawa. I, I focus primarily on uh, you know, cross-border tax issues facing uh, Canadians and uh, purchase real estate in the U.S., so, I mean, 90% of my business is actually U.S.-based, but uh, I do, you know, handle a lot of the Canadian work as well for my clients. Uh, we service clients across the country, so uh, even though we're based out of Ottawa. But, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, uh, I wanted to touch base again. I know it's been a few months since I've been on your show, and I thought, uh, you know, this time of year would be a nice time to uh, reach out and uh, basically talk about some of the issues some of our some of my older citizens face is basically, you know, dealing with uh, a lot of snowbirds that tend to, uh, like, go, go to the U.S., and uh, we talk about some of their tax issues, some of their health, health insurance issues, and stuff like that, so... Yeah, it was definitely timely for that. <laughs> I wish I was down there right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, like I mentioned, I do have some slides which uh, which you will incorporate, but uh, just the kind of agenda, high level. I think we'll talk about some of the travel issues, some of the travel uh, medical, some of the health insurance issues that we face. Uh, you know, just some items that uh, you should you know check off your list uh, before you leave the house. Some of your travel documents that you need, and some of the obviously more, more important factors that I like to touch on is more of the taxation issues that you'll be facing uh, when you cross the border, and uh, you know the issues you face with respect to your houses and stuff like that. So, in theory, so for the for those of you who don't know what a snowbird is, essentially it's basically somebody you know migrating from the northern states or Canada down to the southern states in, in the colder months. It's basically people that you know. Are looking to escape the winters and uh, they don't have jobs and are just you know trying to get trying to spend some time golfing. Uh, you think of t- some of the typical states, obviously the Sun Belt states like Arizona, California, Florida, Nevada, New Mexico, and even in the Mexico, Mexico and Caribbean. And it's a little cheaper than uh, some of the Sun Belt states, so we see a lot of that. So I do have a few clients in my office that uh, do entertain uh, this uh, this process every single year, and um, these are some of the issues that we face on a yearly basis with them. So kind of your travel and medical health insurance, um, you know, a lot of this stuff you can get from the Canadian Snowbird Association. It's actually a pretty pretty nice website for Canadian snowbirds that actually tend uh, that go down to the States on a yearly basis. So they typically recommend, you know, getting your annual flu shot here in Canada while you can, you know, getting up to date with your vaccinations if, you, if you're not, you know, visiting your doctor, your, do- your optometrist, stuff like that, you know, pretty basic stuff, but, you know, bringing your medical bracelet, eyeglass prescriptions, doctor notes, stuff like that. Um, all these items, you know, you probably should keep in, keep keep with you in case, uh, you know, being in a different country, it's nice to have uh, on you at all times. Yep. Yeah, I mean, obviously, additional items uh, from a medical perspective, I would look, you know, reach out to your travel insurance and your travel agent and make sure that he knows that uh, you're leaving the country and that, uh, you know, perhaps you might need additional insurance from a medical perspective. Um, you know some some of the tax savings issues. Like obviously, a lot of senior citizens uh, entertain this process. So certainly, you know, tell them your age. Uh, there might be some discounts with respect to uh, you know if you're a senior citizen, if you're over a certain age, or if you're under a certain age as well. So those are more the kind of the medical issues that I like to touch base on with some of my clients. Um, obviously, there are a lot of household issues that we should touch base on. You know, a lot of the interior stuff. You know, just you know basic stuff. You know. Telling your telephone provider that uh, you're going on vacation and that you want to, you know, cut back on the service, uh, you know, just your health club, stuff like that. A lot of the, you know, changing interior light bulbs, uh, stuff like that, making sure that if it's on a timer, just kind of keep the bad guys away for the most part. But uh, it's something, it's something, that, you know, just make sure your light bulbs are up to date. Yeah. Um, just <laughs> It's like Home Alone. You have to have the guys moving around in the windows. Exactly. So, I mean, stuff like that. These are the kind of conversations we have with my clients. I mean, a lot of these are obviously, you know, 70 and 80-year-old people who, um, you know, tend to forget some of the basic stuff at times, unfortunately. So, obviously, like a lot of the, you know, interior stuff as well, shutting off the water, draining the pipes, uh, you know, electricals, like moving ba- removing batteries, uh, you know, in your remote controls, uh, turning off electrical circuits your, in your TVs, refrigerators, freezers if possible. And just, you know, do- donating a lot of perishable foods as well. I mean, a lot of these people are gone for four, five, six months. So it's nice to kind of drain that, uh, drain your freezer a little bit. So, Yeah, makes sense. 
Um, so more on the finance side, obviously making sure your credit cards are up to date is a big thing. Um, you know, want you want to make sure they don't expire while you're down down south. Um, certainly, you know, reaching out to your financial advisor, letting them know that you're going to be out of the country, and making sure that all your investments are uh, you know aren't safe and that you're actually you don't need to be hands on. Uh, place a lot of valuables that you don't plan on bringing with you, it's like a safety deposit box, uh, some stuff like that. Um, you know, a lot of internet banking, a lot of making sure your utility bills, your properties, taxes on your on your principal residence is taken care of, ideally automatically. Um, you know, stuff like that, and making sure your gym memberships, telephone services, cable is all all also spend a wire away. So yeah, exactly. So I mean, that's kind of the you know, those are a lot of things that we talk I talk about with my clients that going forward. But um, you know, some of the travel documents I would recommend um, you keep on stuff like your passport. Obviously, it's pretty basic, but your Nexus card, you know, identification cards. Medical history, travel insurance. It's always good to keep that kind of with you when um, you know when you're traveling across the border. I would also let people a lot don't forget or t- typically forget is carry a copy of your power of attorney just in case you do get sick or something does happen while you're while you're away. If you're gone for four or five months, that obviously it's maybe a little difficult to come back to Canada and get that. Uh, yeah. Um, no immunization forms not only for you but also for your pets if you're actually bringing them. So it's certainly you know something you should keep with you. Um, and also, one something we're going to talk in a little more details later on is a copy of your 8840 closer connection forms. Um, we'll talk about a little more details, but it's something you should keep with you when you're crossing the border. Okay. So, um, yeah, some additional, you know, typical travel docs. A lot of times, these border agents will request, you know, they want to make sure they're actually coming back to Canada. So they'll, I mean, it's always nice to have like a telephone bill or utility bill or your property tax receipts from your country, from your home, just to make sure that, just to tell them that you're actually not, you know, leaving the country and actually coming back. So stuff like that's always nice to have on, you know, just when you're crossing the border. Um, you know, credit card savings are nice as well. Stuff like that. So, oh, yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff I never even thought it of. Is, it is a lot of stuff. <laughs> but you got to remember, a lot of these, a lot of these guys are gone for four or five months. So I mean, and the U.S. doesn't like people staying in our country. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, unless they're supposed to be there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they don't want you spending money, but they want you. Make, they want to make sure you leave at the end of the uh, few yeah. months. Or this, so. <laughs> So some additional, you know, finance issues. I would recommend you know carrying small, ca- small cash, small cash, uh, small currency. U.S. dollars obviously is nice traveler checks. If obviously uh, CBSA requires you to prefers you to have less than 10k, otherwise going to have additional compliance forms that you need to file if you do carry more than 10k in cash. Um, obviously, credit cards. We mentioned you know making sure your credit cards are not going to be expired and making sure we tell your credit card company that you'll be using it outside the outside of Canada as well. Um, you know, valuables, declare any valuable that you carry, you know, cameras, video recorders, stuff like that. I mean, it's all pretty basic stuff, yeah. but, uh, you know, sometimes we, it does, we do forget about it, so. Oh, yeah. Basic travel preparation, what I re- typically recommend my clients do is even before you enter the U.S., is you make sure you have, a, like, a telephone hookup in, at, at the location, you know, make sure your 911 works on the phone that you, that you be, whether it's the hotel, whether it's the Airbnb, or even your own property if you do have it. Um, another thing that I recommend is, you, you know, get, understand where the location is, the Canadian Embassy in the city you're at. I do have a list, uh, I have do an appendix of these slides that kind of gives you an, uh, an idea of where, where you can go. Um, you know, advise, again, advise your insurance broker that you're taking the, taking your car out of the country for more than 30 days and, and possibly increasing your insurance as well. You know, if you're traveling by sea, ensure you're aware of the ship's travel requirements and and, and your cabin specifications. So stuff like that, it's kind of the basic stuff. But uh, you know, these are the questions that uh, a lot of my clients ask. Oh so, yeah. So that's kind of a lot of the, you know, travel preparations, stuff like that. But um, obviously, the meat of what I talk about is a lot of the taxation issues that we face. You know, from Canadians going down there. Yeah. It is well known that you know U.S. citizens and green card holders residing in the U.S. and outside the U.S. are subject to income taxes on their worldwide income. But what most people don't know is that foreigners who you know who are not U.S. citizens or green card holders and does not have a U.S. income may still be subject to U.S. income tax on their worldwide income. So if you go down there for a certain amount of days, you may be subject to U.S. tax, even though you're actually not not a U.S. citizen. So basically, the IRS considers you to be a U.S. citizen if you meet what's known as a substantial presence test, okay? So there's two requirements. You must be in the United States for 31 days during the year, and you must be within the United States for 183 days accumulated over the past three years. So oh, wait, what was the first part? What was the 31 days part? Yeah, yeah. So you basically need to be in the U.S. for 31 days in the current year. Yeah. 
and 183 days accumulated over the over the full three years. And that's so that's full full amount of days for the current year, one third of the amount of days for the preceding year, and one sixth the amount of days for the two years prior to that. So, so when you add up, it should be pretty easy to get up there if you're spending like you know four months or whatever over the winter. That's just it. So it doesn't it doesn't take a whole lot for you know Canadian snowbirds or even people working down there to make, exceed that 183 days. And if you're if you exceed that 183 days threshold in the U.S. by U.S. law, you are required to basically file a U.S. income tax return and pay U.S. tax on your worldwide income. So even if you don't even work in the U.S., you're still technically required to pay tax in the U.S. So you may have interest, dividends, you know. Uh, business income um, that you may require to pay tax on. Hmm. So that's kind of, yeah, so so based on that, you're considered what's known as a resident alien for U.S. tax purposes. So in the United States, they have what's known as a kind of a close, there's an exception to this rule, I should say. Basically, there's this closer connection form, 8840, that states if you fill out this form and you basically claim that it's in the United States that you are, you know, you're closely connected to a country outside of the United States, you're exempt from that substantial presence. So you don't have to file a U.S. income tax return. You don't have to file a, um, you don't have to pay U.S. federal tax. So this form um, <clears throat> basically states, so it is a form that needs to be filed you know, on a yearly basis. It's typically due by June 15th. Um, but, you know, if you're, obviously it's something that your accountant can take care of. And it is a fairly simple process. But to the IRS wants to know exactly where your closer connection is, whether it's the United States, whether it's to Canada. So you have a lot of these questions of, you know, where's your permanent home? Or most people answer Canada, you know, where your family actually resides, where your personal belongings are, so your cars, your furniture, clothing, jewelry, where most of that is, uh, where your social, political, cultural, and re religious, uh, you know, affiliations are, your business activities, where your driver's license is, you know, you know, in which location you actually have the ability to vote in. So all these questions get asked on these on this 8840 form that needs to be. So this confirmed. form is it like so it's something you file with them. You just like, you, right. you send it in. Okay, and right. then so every, you, you missed this made me like just me thinking of you know trying to be mm -hmm. sneaky. But could you use this? Does it work the opposite way so that if you were you know, you did classify yourself as a resident alien because you've been there enough days? Would it? Is there? A way to get a green card <laughs> if, you, if you've just been squatting long enough does that <laughs> um not particularly because you still need you still need to be hired by somebody to get a green card and do all this okay. stuff I, I mean in theory the re reason people get out of this is so they don't have to file a u.s income tax return right. so they meet, they meet the substantial presence test but this form is kind of the exception to the rule where if you meet kind of and the IRS deems you to be no, a non-resident alien in the U.S., you don't have to file a U.S. income tax, regardless of how long you actually stay there. So. Okay, so for somebody like me, I already file U.S. tax return, but it's yeah. only on my American stuff. Would it make sense for me to do something like this just to keep them out of my Canadian stuff? Or would I, would I just not worry about it because I'm already filing with the IRS with well, my American question. stuff? <laughs> well, if you do meet the substantial presence test, then I would recommend you file this form. So basically, if you don't file this form, the IRS will come back to you and say you're required to pay income tax, your U.S. tax on all your worldwide income. So you're, on your income here in Canada, yeah. you have to file that in the U.S., you have to file your rental properties here in Canada, you have to file that in the U.S., pay tax on it. Um, that sounds so like a mess. <laughs> it is. <laughs> so right now, I mean, you're basically just paying tax in the U.S. based on your U.S. rental income, and yeah. that's, the, that's the sole reason. But if you don't file this form and you meet the substantial presence test, your total worldwide income gets taken into the equation. Okay, makes sense. I, I get yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. In addition to the substantial presence test and the 8840, there are additional filing, you know, U.S. tax filing obligations that may be, may apply to certain individuals. If you open a U.S. bank account um, and you don't have a U.S. what's known as a U.S. ITIN number, uh, the U.S. bank is actually required to withhold 30% of any interest or dividends on investments that are made within the U.S. So a lot of so a lot of banks, so a lot of individuals will actually obtain a U.S. ITIN number just so they can get a withholding obligation. At that point, you have to file most likely have to file a U.S. income tax return, but you probably won't have to pay any taxes. Yeah. Um, does that make sense? <laughs> it makes sense. I, I, I totally get it. I've done lots of, it's lots of work with the I-10. So. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> so, yeah, no, no that, and uh, you can get, what I've learned with the I-10s, like I got my accountant to set it all yeah. up, 
but you can do it yourself. It just means that the process, instead of taking like a couple weeks, takes many many months <laughs> if you do it yourself. But you yeah. still can still can do it. And uh, I didn't think you could, but a, a, a guy I met at the meetup did it himself. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly possible. It's a lot easier if you're going to like a U.S. Um, I don't know say like a U.S. Uh, IRS agency in the U.S. Because here in Canada, you actually have to go through the passport services, get your passport certified, and get it all done, get get it mailed out. I mean, if there's a small issue in your W-7, they'll bring it back. So it can take a lot of mo- a number of months in order to get it completed. But, I mean, it is, you know, yeah. it is something you have to do, unfortunately. So And nowadays, most uh, the IRS will typically require a U.S. tax return with it. So, I mean, they'll only typically, typically uh, give you an ITIN number if you actually have a U.S. Return so basically you need some type of U.S. source income, whether it's like a partnership income or a rental property or whatever the case may be. So yeah, and you yeah. might even you might even just be some stocks or something, right? Because I yeah. I get a W eight Ben with my my yeah. stocks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's quite possible. Again, there's there's you know that third withholding obligation on dividends as well from stocks. So um, you know if you don't file a W eight, then you know that U.S. bank is required to uh, withhold. Thirty percent on on the interest and the dividends that the the stocks give out. So, so that's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah. Federal Form of Fifty Four Seventy Two is a uh, fairly new regulation where it states that any foreigner that owns a single member LLC, so there's only one owner of that U.S. LLC, is now is now required to file what's known as a Fifty Four Seventy Two to report transactions or cash transactions between that LLC. And that person, so that foreigner. Okay. So this is fairly new. So in the past, if you owned a say a vacation rental that you only use personally through an LLC, basically you didn't have to do anything until you actually sold the property. You'd report the gain and you know pay the necessary tax. Nowadays, now you actually have to report you know the property taxes paid. So basically, if that individual funds that you know that property through the LLC, now you have to f- file a fifty four seventy two. And you have to basically report the property taxes, the maintenance, all that stuff. And, f- and unfortunately, if you actually don't pay that or don't file that 5472 every year, there is a $10,000 penalty that the IRS assesses for non-filing. The so first thing the- that jumped into my head there was like, yep. why would someone fund an, <laughs> their own personal uh, vacation property through an LLC? But I get that uh, yeah. you know, you're not necessarily there. So if someone trips and falls on it, then you're limited to the property. So it's just... Uh, you know, an asset protection. You know, it's save, save your own hide. So that Absolutely. you use the, you don't need all the parts of the LLC, but you can. Uh, yeah, I get it now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's been it's been pretty burdensome in the past couple of years. Uh, I mean, with this new regulation, a lot of people are coming in, getting notices from IRS that you know they have an LLC and they're you don't have a US ITIN, so automatically they get this assessment that they have to file the 5472, and if it's not filed, obviously timely filed. Um, you know, there is that ten thousand dollar penalty, which you know can be pretty excessive for most people. So, <laughs> and it's a yearly penalty, and uh, yeah, it's 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 pretty bur- burdensome, unfortunately. So, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the vacation properties. So, uh, the United States, the IRS, they have what's known as like a de minimis threshold, where if you rent your house for less than two weeks, or basically fourteen days or less, you don't have to report the rental income or you know or the expenses on your tax return. It's basically just a threshold where they give you kind of free and clear. If you do rent the property for more than fourteen days, IRS will automatically will require you to report that all that rental income generated, and at that point you have to deduct some of the expenses to the extent of the rental income. So you can't report a loss, but you do have to report all the income. And this isn't like a specific form. This is just part of doing taxes, right? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So this is kind of, exactly. So if you have a vacation rental in Florida, you know you're there six months, whatever. You have some friends that go down there and rent it out for two weeks. You're typically fine. If you have you put a renter in there for a month or two when you're not there, then all of a sudden, then you have to file a U.S. tax return. You do have to you know report that rental income, and you do have to report the expense, and you can report the expenses related to that rental income. So. Gotcha. Yeah, so it's basically kind of like a diminished, de minimis threshold where you know if you're two weeks is kind of the threshold. If you do anything above that, you have to report the income. So makes sense. And if you do, and in theory, if you choose not to file a U.S. tax return, you don't have to file an income tax return. But the tenant is actually supposed to withhold thirty percent of the gross rents, and and actually pay to the IRS if you if if you're required to <laughs> if you're required to uh, report that income. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure they'll do that for you. Exactly. I know. <laughs> So it's supposed to happen, but that technically doesn't happen. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Canadian taxation rules, um, they are fairly similar. You know, uh, we have a federal T1. Um, you know, if, if a U.S. citizen comes to Canada and is required to, you know, basically uh, opens up a bank account and receives some interest, a little bit of dividends from some stocks if possibly, CRA actually has a withholding obligation of 30% as well. Um, so CRA, the 10, 1035 is essentially it's for any Canadian that owns property in the in a foreign country or, you know, it doesn't have to be property, it can be stocks, it can be bonds, any type of investments that exceeds $100,000. So if you own a vacation rental or, uh, you know, a rental property in the U.S. that exceeds $100,000 cost basis, so not the actual fair market value, but what you actually paid for it, if it exceeds $100,000 in a foreign country, you have to you have to check a box on your T1 tax return and if you file this new form 10 or T1135 to report that foreign, foreign, foreign property. Yeah, so we talked about you know the federal form T776. It's pretty similar to um, you know basically the rental properties. It's for a Canadian. If you own a rental property in the U.S. or a vacation property that earns some rental property, you have to report that income and loss here in Canada as well. As a Canadian resident, you're taxed on your worldwide income, so not just the income you earn here in Canada, but if you own you know make rent have rental property in in Florida that generates rental property, you have to, or rental income, you have to report that income on your T776 here in Canada as well. So. Yeah, and if you're like, because I know people might be thinking, oh, well, I'm going to be paying tax in Canada, I'm going to be paying tax in the U.S., but there is yeah. a tax credit if you actually pay tax in the U.S., but Correct. I, you're, you're more likely to be paying tax in Canada than in the U.S. because they're... Yeah, no. That's that's correct. So there is, you know, if you if you structure properly, structure rental property properly or a vacation property yeah. properly, you know, there are foreign tax credits that can mitigate the taxes from both country. So you're not being double taxed. Obviously, you pay tax on the higher, you know, Canadian side because we do have higher taxes here. But again, you're not double taxed. You're not paying tax on both sides of the border. So perfect. So I mean, obviously, that's my contact information. Like I mentioned previously, we are an auto-based firm. Uh, we do service clients across the country, though. Um, but uh, but 50% of our business is actually Canadians that purchase investments in the U.S. So if you do have any you know, further questions, by all means, uh, my contact my email is there, my cell phone number is there. Feel free to give me a call uh, whenever you have a chance. So That's awesome. That's very generous. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again for coming on the show. I really appreciate your time. My pleasure, Glenn. It's always great.